Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the topic of personal mythology. With me is Professor Stanley Krippner, the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University in San Francisco. Dr. Krippner is the author or editor or co-author of dozens of books and in particular one called Personal Mythology, co-authored with David Feinstein, Understanding Your Evolving Self, working with rituals to understand your own personal story. In addition, he is a past president of several psychological organizations. He is the recipient of lifetime career awards from several psychological organizations. So it's an honor to be with him today. Welcome, Stan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I like the idea of personal mythology because it suggests that each one of us, even though we may think of ourselves as living uh, a small story, uh, you know, we, we have our occupations, we have our families, uh, relatives, our communities, but the idea of mythology suggests that we're all connected to a larger story, an archetypal story. You are so right. And like all my other professional interests, this one goes back to my childhood, where a relative gave me a whole set of encyclopedia about mythology. Mm -hmm. And I read them cover to cover, and that's how I became acquainted with Greek and Roman myths, but also Nordic myths and Slavic myths, Native American myths, etc. Some of your listeners might want to know how I define myth. Many, many definitions, many of them too esoteric. They bring in uh, creation, they bring in gods and goddesses, things that you can't pin down, what we call in psychology operationally. So I say a myth is a statement or a story about important existential issues that has operational and behavioral consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a myth is not something which is mere fantasy, it affects how you live your life and how you make choices in your life. And once I began to do some reading as a student, I ended up becoming a fan of the books of Joseph Campbell. Of course. Who I later became a friend of. In mm -hmm. fact, last uh, year I actually went to Hawaii for the 100th birthday party of his wife, Jean Erdman. Mm. So we have had a long association, and his book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces, is really a precursor of personal mythology, mm -hmm. because he says, well, you read about Jupiter, you read about Zeus, you read about Minerva, they might be standing on the street corner or sitting next to you in a restaurant. People still are acting out these archetypal themes and images. Mm -hmm. And then I also, talking about Alan Watts, in some of the seminars I went to with Alan Watts, he would talk about Eastern mythologies from India, Japan, and China. And then my work with shamans, I came across African mythology, South American mythologies, Australian mythologies. So I had a lot of immersion in mythologies and then, curious thing happened. I became friends with David Feinstein, and he invited me to his home in San Diego, and there was a half-written manuscript on personal mythology for the Journal of Orthopsychiatry. He said, you know, I just cannot finish this article. And I looked at it. Well, that's because you don't know very much about cultural myths. Mm. You've got to integrate the cultural myths with the personal myths. So I helped him finish the article, and then that led to some joint articles, eventually to workshops at Esalen Institute, and then 
we got an offer to do a book. So that book has been in print since the middle 1980s. Mm -hmm. That book is the text at Saybrook University for a course on personal mythology, the most popular elective in the curriculum. And people say, this has changed my life. The 22 rituals in the book, if they're carried out properly, get people to question their belief systems, their personal myths. Then there was a very big impact from my dear friend Albert Ellis, who I knew for nearly half a century before mm -hmm. his demise, and he talked about rational, irrational belief systems. Mm -hmm. So I incorporated that into the picture. Well, many people who are of a skeptical inclination would say a myth is simply an irrational belief, a fantasy, something that's not true. You're better off uh, not having any myths at all in your life. Yes. The word myth has taken on that hue in popular parlance, which mm -hmm. is a shame. Mm -hmm. And people are always saying, why don't you use a different word like theme, worldview, paradigm? I say, if you want to do that, you can, but the word myth leaves out the transpersonal, it leaves out the spiritual, it leaves out the archetypal, which is why I still cling to the word myth. And I talked, Albert Ellis has read my work on personal mythology. He said, you know, your work on personal mythology, my work on belief is exactly the same, except you're a little more transpersonal than I am. Mm -hmm. Well, you've used the word archetypal. It's a word that I think is largely derived from Jungian yes. psychology. And it's a word often associated with mythological figures. Yes, it is. But, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that I find is that it's a very mysterious word. Uh, people use it a lot, but uh, very few people are able to define what an archetype is. I wonder if you could uh, do that. Yeah, very simply. An archetype is an experience or a feeling or an image that everybody seems to have in common. And so you take the yin-yang symbol, which both of us are wearing. Well, that represents the polarities of life which constantly revolve. There's a little bit of yang in every yin, there's a little bit of yin in every yang, there's a little bit of good in every bad, there's a little bit of bad in every good, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of female in every male, there's a little bit of male in every female. Mm -hmm. All right, that's sort of a universal experience, that's archetypal. This is what we call an archetypal symbol. Okay. and. Uh, I did have the pleasure of interviewing Jean Shinoda Bolin, a Jungian therapist who has written a couple of books along the same lines, Gods in Every Man, Goddesses in Every Woman. And uh, her point was that if we're not conscious of the myth uh, that is uh, un operating in our lives, then the myth runs us. If we, we become, in effect, the slave to a myth that we're, we, we may not even fully understand. And she felt we have to become conscious because these archetypes often have a dark aspect to them. And uh, by becoming aware of them through some of the processes that you're uh, describing, then, then we can turn that around uh, from being something detrimental in our lives to something positive. Good heavens, Jean is a friend of mine for 50 years, one of the wisest people I know, male or female, a psychoanalyst. Anything she's written, your listeners should read and they'd derive benefits from. Yes, again, along the lines of Joseph Campbell, there's a deity, a god, a mythology in all of us. Mm -hmm. And she told people to try to find out what they had in common with the Athena myths in Rome, the Minerva myth, or the Jupiter myth, the Zeus myth, mm -hmm. or the Mercury myth, for example. She did a masterful job in that book. I wouldn't even try to rewrite it or repeat it in any way. Mm -hmm. Well, you and I share some things in common. We're both engaged in work that takes the inner esoteric realities and brings them to a, a larger public. And uh, would you say we're being guided by a myth in, in doing that? Yes, I don't think anything should remain esoteric or hidden. If it's going to be of value, let's put it to use. The world is in very bad shape. The planet is in very bad shape. Let's use all of our accumulated knowledge, 
whether it comes from shamans, whether it comes from uh, ancient traditions, whether it comes from myth, put it to use. Let's save people, let's save the planet, let's uh, save the wildlife, let's save nature. We don't have any time to use, to lose, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, what would be the guiding myth for, for that sentiment that you just voiced? The guiding myth would be, in my opinion, let's be of service. Let's be of service to each other. Let's be of service to all creation. Mm -hmm. Let's, this is a hard thing to do, let's realize the unity of humankind the unity of all nature, including humans, that in some sense of the word are all one, it's going to be a struggle. Let's bypass the sectarian battles and ideological and irrational belief systems. You know, Albert Ellis was a very bitter foe of organized religion. Yes. I can't blame him. Look what our organized religion has get, done to mm -hmm. us in terms of Catholics fighting Protestants, Shiites fighting Sunnis, uh, Hindus fighting Muslims in India. I mean, <laughs> organized religion has, you know, given us some positive things, but in this day and age, um, I think we have to really question what's going to happen if these sectarian and religious conflicts mm -hmm. don't find a broader mythology that can produce unity instead of disunity. Well, it sounds to me as if what you're saying is that, uh, referring back to the yin-yang, yes. uh, that being of service means include, uh, being of service to the whole, to the yin and the yang, whereas uh, many people, particularly uh, those that caught up in various conflicts, secular and sectarian conflicts, have a myth more, it's black and white. I'm on the good side and I've got to fight evil everywhere. And, and so it's, they get locked in struggle. And in so doing, it seems as if it's very hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys after a while. You bet, you bet. I think that, uh, again, if we recognize unity and stress unity instead of disunity, recognize balance instead of imbalance, we're really reflecting the mythology of the ancient shamans. Indigenous people around the world that I visit, if there is one thing that is common with them, it's balance. A balanced personal life, a balanced community life, a balance with the environment, a balance with nature, a balance with the cosmos. This is what the modern world really needs more of, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yet many people, uh, I suppose, uh, in your groups go through uh, processes of dream analysis and they might discover that their life is uh, being operated by or they're under the sway of a very different myth. Like we, we talked about the hero with a thousand faces. Yes, right. The myth of the hero is often somebody who has to go into battle. Yes. Yes, well, there are different types of heroes. Yeah. And the heroes can be male or they can be female. The battle is sort of an outmoded myth. Now the hero today is the hero who fights for equal rights for women, the hero who fights for saving the environment, the hero who fights for sexual equality in terms of gender equality. There's a role for heroism. My friend Phil Zimbardo has a hero project, finding heroes in everyday life. Philip Zimbardo. Philip Zimbardo. And Phil has done wonderful things in terms of finding heroes and raising them to the forefront and giving them some publicity. Mm -hmm. Now you talked about dreams. I'll tell your listeners a very quick way to discover the personal myth in a dream. First of all, you take a dream that has some emotion in it. Second, you take that emotion into your body. Third, you go back to something in your life where you felt the same emotion and ask yourself, what came out of that experience for me? One sentence. That's a personal myth. Mm -hmm. I can never be as good as my sister. Dysfunctional personal myth. If I work hard, I can achieve anything I want to do. Sad to say another d dysfunctional personal myth. 
I want to express love to all of creation. Oh, that's a pretty functional personal myth. Mm -hmm. I need to work hard to succeed in my job. Okay, that's a functional personal myth. You take these personal myths that came out of that emotional experience, take it back to the dream. More often than not, you will find the dream commenting on that personal myth. Mm -hmm. The dream will either say that personal myth is dysfunctional, it's no good, get rid of it, or it will say that's a pretty solid personal myth, hang on to it. Or it will say, have to tweak that a little bit to bring it up to date. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that I do myself in the morning. It just takes a few minutes. And I have a whole list of personal myths that have come out of that very quick and easy type of dream interpretation. Doesn't work all the time, but it works more often than not. Mm -hmm. Because dreams are images that we tie together and make a story out of, almost always the story is an emotional story that reflects some personal myth that ties our psyche together. So what you're saying is you spend a little time every day looking at your dreams to see what your dreams are telling you about the myths that you've identified in your life. That's right. And sometimes there are surprises. Sometimes I don't realize that myth, but there it is underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. Now, you've also talked about the use of ritual. Yes. How does that work? Well, our book, Personal Mythology, has, like I say, 22 personal rituals, everything from drawing a mandala, which is another archetypal symbol, mm -hmm. and a mandala is usually divided into four. Okay, so you put an image from your past, an image from your present, an image from your future, and an image from your transpersonal future. These are the divisions, again, that uh, Philip Zimbardo talks about in his book about time. Now we better define what we mean by transpersonal future. Transpersonal means beyond the personal concerns. What's going to happen, for example, when we pass mm -hmm. and die? Yeah. Maybe a future life, maybe a legacy that we're leaving, maybe uh, the other side, what mm -hmm. often is called heaven or nirvana or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that spirituality should be left out of our personal mythology, mm -hmm. whatever that spirituality might mean to yeah. somebody. Yeah. So the images that come up in our dreams are so important, I really like people to spend a little bit of time drawing them mm -hmm. and reflecting upon the image. And an image that has a deeper meaning is what we call a symbol. An activity that has a deeper meaning is what we call a metaphor. And dreams are filled with symbols and metaphors. That's their shorthand for pulling a lot of material together into a nice little package and bringing it to our attention. Even if we don't know it consciously, mm -hmm. we know it unconsciously. Well, the great psychoanalyst Eric Fromm referred to the language of metaphors and symbols that appears in dreams as the, the forgotten language. The forgotten language, which is a shame. Now, we have to re-remember that language to remember the personal myths in our dreams, to identify symbols and metaphors in the dreams, and that gives us a richer inner life. You know, from a neuropsychological point of view, we think we make a conscious decision, but that decision has already been made for us unconsciously. Now, knowing that, we'd better get in touch with our unconscious, in touch with our dreams, in touch with what's beneath the surface, so that we consciously make the decision that's already been made for us and that this is something that carries that personal myth into our everyday life and impacts our behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you just said something incredibly profound that uh, we often think we're making conscious choices when we're not. That's right. Our conscious psyche is small compared to the unconscious psyche, which is why we need to be more familiar with what goes on under the surface. That's where Eric Fromm was talking about in terms of the forgotten language. Mm -hmm. That's why the great psychotherapists and psychoanalysts put a stress on getting to know the totality of our belief and behavior system. Mm -hmm. 
Well, in addition to ritual and, and dream work, are there other processes that you use to help people work with their own personal mythology? Yes. You asked about ritual. I should define ritual for your listeners. Mm -hmm. A ritual is a step-by-step -step process toward an ultimate goal. That's it. Mm. We do rituals every day. Indeed. Let's make sure that those rituals are in our service, not into our disservice. Some people have very dysfunctional rituals where they go, oh, I'll never be able to surmount that problem. I'm no good. I'm worthless. Why am I even alive? That's a way of ritualistic thinking, mm -hmm. and the desired goal is one's demise. Mm -hmm. You've got to break a ritual that is leading downward and substitute a ritual that's leading you forward. Mm -hmm. Even some types of hand washing can be a ritual. And people who are compulsive hand washers do that over and over again because it's taken on a metaphorical meaning. Yes. Meals are a wonderful ritual. This is why, as Alan Watts told me, you need to enjoy your food and be mindful when you eat, and you will get more pleasure and more nourishment if you look upon eating not as a fast food exercise you do for expediency, but enjoying every bite, enjoying what you choose, and nourishing your body accordingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when we look at um, the range of archetypal energies that could be operating in our lives and uh, mm -hmm. in our own personal mythology, you've already referred to indigenous peoples and to Eastern culture and yes. to Western culture. Uh, I think that throughout all of these, there, there are certain commonalities, and one of them that uh, seems particularly profound and maybe deserves a little more comment is the archetype of the trickster. Oh, yes, the trickster is so important. You find the trickster in a lot of shamanic traditions, a lot of native mythology, and again, from the Western point of view, the trickster is getting us into trouble, it's upsetting the apple cart. But in the mythologies you're talking about, the trickster is there to teach us a lesson. Mm -hmm. And we might have our short-term goals interrupted by the trickster, but if we learn from the trickster, we have long-term goals that will turn out better. And of course, the African-Brazilian religions have a trickster. The male trickster is the Eshu, and the female trickster is the Pombajera. And the Catholics came, oh, that's it. those are satanic, that's the devil, we'll paint them red and black. Mm. That was not the role of the trickster at all. The tricksters were teachers. Mm -hmm. Yes, they did mix up people's prayers, but that's because the people were praying for the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And so there's something to be learned from a trickster, and I think that what many people feel is a spiritual emergency where they have a nightmare, where things don't work out well, where they lose faith in God or lose faith in their marriage or their friendship. Learn from that. That's the trickster that might be trying to teach you something so that you do better the next time. So the trickster archetype, yes, you find in all of the great mythologies, and if you look carefully, on the surface, the trickster can really upset what you're doing, but on a deeper level, the trickster is a great teacher. I'm particularly intrigued by the uh, Greek god Hermes, who is the a trickster, but is also uh, the, I guess the term would be the psychopomp, the one who leads one into the depths of the psyche, who is the initiator into uh, spiritual depths. Oh, the psychopomp. The psychopomp is an important archetype. The mm -hmm. psychopomp takes people on journeys, mm -hmm. journeys to the world, journeys to the depth of the psyche, and, and yes, uh, the psychopomp is often personified in such uh, Greek mythologies as Hermes, for mm -hmm. example. One of my Indonesian friends had three dreams, that's why I'm wearing an Indonesian shirt, I wanted to tell mm -hmm. you about this, yes. three dreams, he wanted to build a house, but in his society that was very ostentatious to mm -hmm. build a house. But he had enough money to do it. He wanted to do it in Indonesian style. He lived on the island of Bali. He had three dreams. 
And in the dreams, Arjuna, one of the Hindu heroes, yes. came to him and said, yes, it's okay to build the house. He woke up from the dream, believe it or not, there in his bed was a little Arjuna coin. Hmm. Rare, rare coin. That was the confirmation for him to build the house. He built his house. He had it concentrated and consecrated in Hindu style, lives there happily with his family to this day. Mm -hmm. Rather than succumbing to the cultural myth, you're too poor to build a house, you're not humble, you shouldn't build your own house, he became, in his own way, a hero and inspired other people who had the money to do so to build their houses because sometimes a cultural myth can be outmoded mm -hmm. because there are cultural myths, personal myths, family myths, ethnic myths, organizational myths, in other words, business and religious myths. Mm -hmm. All five mythologies might impact upon somebody. You have to sort of separate one, one's mythologies out, again, using Albert Ellis's terms, which is rational, which are irrational, mm -hmm. which makes sense, which don't make sense, which are for life, which ones are not for life. That's the guideline. Stanley Krippner, once again, our time is up, but it's been a great pleasure to explore how human beings can find this sort of archetypal power and energy and transform their lives. Thank you so much for being with me. You're more than welcome. And thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.